In the Bible, Romans 7, 14 through 25 is a biblical passage where the Apostle Paul reflects on the struggle between his desires to do what is right and his experience of giving in to sinful impulses. This tension between how he wants to feel and respond and what he chooses to do is disconnected and creates internal strife because emotions are complex. And this is what we're diving into today. Welcome to the Thought Vault, where we learn to unlock our minds to live with more purpose and bold intention. I'm your host, Emily Vermillion. Take a deep breath and let's get started. Welcome back to the Thought Vault today, everyone. So we're talking about the complexity of emotions. And in the context of emotions, self-control can involve managing and regulating our emotional responses to various situations. Emotions are a natural and essential part of our of our being a human, and they can sometimes lead us astray or cause us to act impulsively if we don't exercise control over them. So controlling our emotions requires self-awareness, recognizing our emotional triggers, and understanding how our emotions can influence our thoughts and actions. It really really involves pausing, reflecting, and responding in a thoughtful and intentional manner rather than just acting impulsively when we have those emotions come up. In the passage from Romans, Paul expresses his struggle with doing what he knows is right by finding himself doing the opposite. And I know we've all been there and I've been there many times. This internal conflict highlights like the ongoing battle between our desires and our conscious, including the management of emotions. So while the passage focuses on the tension between sin and righteousness, it indirectly suggests the importance of self-control and the the need to align our actions with our beliefs. I'm going to go ahead and read the passage so we all know from the context that we're talking about. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am of the flesh, sold under sin. For I do not understand my own actions. For I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. Now, if I do what I do not want, I agree with the law that it is good. So now it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. For I know that nothing good dwells in me that is in my flesh. For I have the desire to do what is right, but not the ability to carry it out. For I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I keep on doing. Now, if I do what I do not want, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. So I find it to be a law that when I want to do right, evil lies close at hand. For I delight in the law of God in my inner being, but I see in my members another law, waging war against the law of my mind and making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. Wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? Wow. When I read this passage, it speaks to me on so many different levels because we've all had this strife in and amongst us where, you know, we want to seek God's will, but we take control of it, the situation, you know, ourselves. We have this propensity to constantly choose the things we know are not serving us well in our daily life because they've just become habit. And we sometimes make decisions knowing that the consequence could be grave. This is just part of our human condition. And Paul speaks to this. This passage talks about that struggle with the desires of our flesh and struggling with the need for short-term gain in spite of knowing the effects that it will have. We find ourselves battling with our flesh and the spirit glorifying ourselves or glorifying God becomes the option. We often fall short and are unable to believe the right thing. So this passage from Romans serves as a reminder of the ongoing struggle between our human desire and our spiritual aspirations and just highlighting the importance of self-control and emotional management and maintaining that strong connection connection with our faith. And it's so important we talk about this right now because with the state of our society and the politics that are going on, people are very quick to their emotions and gaslighting, the trendy term, is such a component of our daily lives when we are inundated with things like social media and the ability to see so many people's opinions and being able to hide behind the screen and really have these arguments with people. Emotions are not prompted in spite of us. They are prompted because of us. And our emotions are not just random occurrences. They are a result of our thoughts and our perceptions and the interpretations of events and situations going on around us. The way that we perceive and evaluate a situation determines the emotions that we experience in response. For example, if we interpret a situation as threatening or unjust, we may experience anger or fear. If we perceive an event as joyful or positive, we might feel happiness or excitement. And we can't often combat those like a a woman on her wedding day, she's probably glowing and smiling just on her own. It's just this emotive experience because of what's going on on around her. These feelings just come up as 
an automatic response to the situation that you're in. Our thoughts and beliefs and past experiences and our personal values all contribute to the way that we are responding emotionally to the various circumstances that we face throughout our day. And while external factors do influence our emotions to to an extent, such as other people's behaviors or the conditions going on around us, it's ultimately our internal process and interpretation that gives rise to a specific emotional response. Like one thing that might really upset somebody may just roll off the back of somebody else, right? We all have differences. Some things quote unquote trigger one person and doesn't mean a hill of beans to the next. So we have some level of agency and control over how we respond emotionally to all these different situations. So understanding this connection between our thoughts, interpretations, and emotions really empowers us to take responsibility for those emotional responses. And by developing self-awareness and practice practicing cognitive and emotional regulation, we can really influence and manage our emotions in a more intentional and constructive way. So it's important to note that this perspective does not diminish the validity or intensity of our emotions because our emotions are genuine and they definitely serve as valuable signals that provide us with so much information about who we are. But by acknowledging our role in prompting the emotions, we can cultivate emotional intelligence, which really makes us have more conscious awareness when we are making choices and how we are interacting with the things going on in our life. It's important to ask ourselves, where is this really coming from? Because it is difficult to face the reality of our sin nature, but it's necessary in order to grow and mature and develop our ability to be more like Christ. So when we are dealing with these angry emotions that are bubbling up and coming to the surface, we really need to ask ourselves, what is the root? This self-reflection and introspection are indeed so important to understanding the deeper roots of our emotions and behaviors and including the recognition of our own shortcomings and sins, it's very challenging to confront and acknowledge our flaws and those sinful tendencies that we have, but it's necessary for the personal growth and spiritual development that we want to achieve and how we want to better ourselves. So by asking ourselves, where is this really coming from? We get into the underlying motivations, the beliefs, and the values that are contributing to those thoughts, those emotions, and ultimately our actions. So this process really helps us uncover our sinful patterns, destructive habits that we may have, or areas where we may be falling sure of aligning with God's teachings and his expectations. So facing the reality of our sin requires humility and honesty and willingness to examine ourselves with this sincere desire for the transformations. When you're struggling with emotional health, you know, sometimes it it drums up discovering past traumas or hurts that have impacted us in a way that establishes certain beliefs and expectations. So when those are challenged, we often have that swift and immediate emotional response. It trips that proverbial wire and our core paradigm is triggered and we have to to really have a practiced understanding of this in order to train our brain in another direction. So growing and maturing and developing our ability to be more, more like Christ really involves having this introspection, learning from our mistakes, and actively working towards aligning our thoughts and emotions and behaviors with the teachings of Jesus. So it's like this transformative journey that we requires continuous effort because as we go along in our life, we're going to have more traumas, more hurts, more things that go on that trigger emotions from us. So dealing with your emotions in a healthful way, in a deeper way than just ignoring them really sets us up to have a lot more emotional health. And so remembering that we're not all perfect and in God's in through God's grace, we are able to go on the spiritual development journey because we have the compassion and patience and this commitment to continual improvement through the the love of God. So if we suppress or avo- avoid our emotions, the root of the problem still remains and we continue to invade our feelings and responses in that in any future situation. So suppressing or avoiding our emotions without addressing it leads to long-term problems and emotions serve as valuable signals that indicate something within us that needs attention or resolution. Emotions are so eye-opening and they're so helpful in really getting us to a place where we can emotionally respond with grace and love. And when we we suppress or ignore them, we temporarily avoid that discomfort, but the root cause of that emotion just gets deeper and more ingrained and stays unresolved. And then it can just easily resurface. The more that emotion finds its way into you, into your spirit, into your heart, it's easy to recall that. So it impacts our future responses and our relationships and ultimately our well-being. So addressing the root of our emotions is super important for healing and growth. And it involves exploring what the things 
things are that contribute to these swift reactions that we have. We gain a better understanding of ourselves and our triggers, and this gives us the ability to respond a lot more healthy. So how can we do this? We can take time to journal, pray, practice stillness and awareness, practice listening, active listening. There's so many tools about how to be an active listener. That way, when you're discussing something with someone, you are instead in your head having your own dialogue. You're outside of that. And you're really listening to the person so that when you respond, you're not approaching it from this triggered emotive response because it's drumming up past hurts and pains. Practicing that helps us establish this slowness to reaction and giving us a time to gather ourselves and compose ourselves in a more Christ-like manner. So even when we know what is right or good, we may still choose to do the wrong thing or see red, as they say, being overcome with our emotions. In Romans 7, 24, Paul exclaims, what a wretched man I am. Who will rescue me from this body of death? If we cannot control our emotions, our minds and our hearts, what hope do we have? You know, who's going to rescue us and help us? But without delay comes the answer in Romans 7, 25, the very next verse. Paul's expressing his de- his deep sense of struggle, his realization of his own human limitations. He knows that despite, of no- despite knowing what is right or good, he still finds himself choosing these wrong things. And this inner conflict and recognition of his own shortcomings leads him to ask, who will rescue me? And the answer is 725, thanks be to God who delivers me through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Paul acknowledges that the ultimate source of hope and rescue is through Jesus Christ. So as humans, we indeed face challenges in controlling our emotions, our minds, our hearts, our inerrant flaws and limitations make it so difficult to consistently make the right choices and live up to the ideals we have. But through faith in Jesus Christ, we find the hope, the redemption, the forgiveness, and the transformation, the sanctification. Jesus offers the rescue and the help that we need. He came to reconcile us with God, to offer forgiveness for our sins, and empower power us through the Holy Spirit to live according to God's will. So through Jesus's teachings and the grace that we are given through God, we find strength and guidance to navigate these complex emotions and the thoughts and the traumas and the pains and the hurts and the desires that we have. We all struggle with and face these types of challenges. So our hope lies in this transformative power of God's love and the ongoing process of sanctification. So by surrendering our lives to God and seeking his guidance, relying on his strength, we can experience this work, this transformative work within us by aligning our emotions and thoughts and actions with his will. So even in the face of our own limitations, we find hope and rescue through our relationship with Jesus, embracing his grace and following the example that Jesus has given to us. Our source of strength to grow in this area of emotional health comes from God. For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but one of power, love, and sound judgment. 2 Timothy 1.7. As God begins his good work in us through the sanctification, the fruit of the spirit produces is this self-control. So our source of strength to for our own self-control to grow in this area and this emotional management comes from God. The verse 2 Timothy 1 7 tells us that God has not given us a spirit of fear, but one of power and love and sound judgment. So through the process of the sanctification, which is God's ongoing work in our lives, we experience the development of qualities like self-control. And as we surrender ourselves to God's guidance and rely on the power of the Holy Spirit, we really see this fruit of the spirit manifesting in our lives in a way that reaps self-control, a spirit of love, joy, peace, and patience. Just like in Galatians 5, 22 uh, through 23, they talk about the fruit of the spirit, which are love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. These qualities are not something we can manufacture on our own, but they are produced within us as a result of God's work and his presence in our lives. So if we're really struggling with our emotions, we really have to take a step back and say, where's God's role in all of this? Where is his priority in my perspective about life? Where is his presence in my daily walk? Do I have self-control? If I have self-control, then I have the spirit of the Lord within me. If I'm lacking self-control, we need to work on this. So self-control is one of those spirits of the fruit that empowers us to manage our emotions and our thoughts and our actions so that we are in alignment with God and it allows us to resist the impulses. It helps us to exercise restraint and to make choices that honor God and really do contribute to our overall, like, overall well-being. So 
we're not a victim to ourselves. We're not a victim to our circumstances. We're not a victim to our emotions. Our emotions don't control us. We ultimately control them. And if they are controlling us, it's a sin problem. So as we cultivate a relationship with God and spend time in prayer, study his word and seek his guidance, we open ourselves to this power of the Holy Spirit. And through his grace, we're able to grow in areas of self-control and other ways, the other fruits of the spirit that really rely on God's strength rather than our own. It's important to remember that this is like a cooperative effort between God's work in us and our willingness to cooperate with God's process. We can trust that God will continue to develop self-control within us as we seek him and submit to his leading. We cannot change the way that we feel, but with the help of the spirit, we can change the way that we respond to what we feel or what we choose to believe about what we feel. So while we may not have complete control over our initial emotion react, emotional reactions, we do have the ability with the help of the Holy Spirit to change how we respond to those emotions or what we choose to believe about them. This guidance, this empowerment of the Holy Spirit, we are able to develop greater self-awareness, discernment, and wisdom about our own emotions, about the reality. So many of, so many of us are walking around in our own reality. And we think, you know, oh, that person was mean to me because they must not like me. And, you know, when really in the reality, they just had a really crummy morning it has nothing to do with you, right? We always think everything going around, going on around us has to do with us. When we have this understanding, this Holy Spirit understanding and this empowerment to respond in a godlike manner, we cultivate a mindset that really aligns with God's truth. And this enables us to make intentional and wise choices despite the presence of these strong triggered emotions. If we feel anger, instead of letting it control us and leading to destructive behavior, we seek God's guidance and respond with patience. This is never more practiced in my life than with my own kids, right? Like they do something you've just told them not to do. They do it and they get hurt. Your immediate response is like, oh, why did you do that? I just told you not to. But instead, if we seek the Holy Spirit's guidance, we're responding with patience and understanding to our child, which really helps them have a more effective understanding of what just happened. Like if we immediately immediately are like, why did you do that? We scream. Their body shuts down. They're not even really comprehending the full consequence. But if we respond out of, oh, are you okay? Are, are you feeling okay? I wanted you not to step on that because I was worried this would happen. And if you're being soft, their heart is softened to hearing your voice and they can understand, oh, that's what mom meant. So if we feel sadness or anxiety, we turn to God for comfort, for that peace, for that strength. We allow his truth to anchor us in those times so that we can be more effective all around us and in our lives, emotionally within us. And when we respond that way to our kids, it it helps us have a better understanding with them. It helps them have a greater understanding. So it's a full circle moment to allow God's presence to embody that moment of that emotion. While we may not always have this immediate mastery over our emotions, it's a practice and we can continually rely on the Holy Spirit's guidance because he's never leaving us and the renewal of our minds can happen at any moment to help shape our responses. So emotions often show us what we love or value and we can do the hard work to get to the root of repenting of our idols and trusting in the goodness of God so that we can really fight these temptations to sin or our need to control a situation. Situation that really out of our control. It helps us to have not new feelings, but a new heart that loves and worships God in the way we're living out our life. And repentance plays a crucial role in all of this. It involves really acknowledging and turning away from anything that we have elevated to a position of importance or reliance that belongs solely to truly to God. Repentance allows us to realign our heart and redirect our affections and restore God to his rightful place as the ultimate object of our love and worship and the way that we are approaching our day. As we seek to control our emotions, it's indeed more than just managing or suppressing them. It's about this uh, this deeper heart level work and allowing God's work to reshape our heart and our, our triggers, so to speak. It involves really inviting the Holy Spirit to renew us, reshape us, and help us to conform to God's perfect will. So in the battle against temptation and sinful inclination, our primary need is indeed for our new heart that loves and worships God to rise above. As we cultivate this deeper relationship with God and immerse ourselves in his word and foster a life of prayer and worship, our emotions and desires become more and more aligned with his purpose 
and really reflect his goodness. And that's how we are like, that's the lens, that's the glasses that we have on during our life, during our day. So through this process, we are experiencing the freedom and joy and peace that come from our hearts that's captivated by God's love. And it's through this love that we find the strength and motivation to control our emotion and redirect them to be more pure and noble and more Christ-like. And this helps us to love the things that God loves and hate the things that God hates, which gives us this life that reflects less of us and more of him, which ultimately brings the most contentment and peace that we will ever find. So we shouldn't ignore our our emotions, but really see them as tools to really dig deeper in our connection to God so that we can pull on who God is, his character, to help root out that sin nature in us and develop a source of control that is that is formed through the Holy Spirit working within us. Emotions are so complex and they are a part of our human condition. We see in scripture all kinds of examples of of emotional distress and how human beings since the beginning have struggled with this desire to answer the call of our flesh or of our sin nature, but also knowing right from wrong. It's the moral code that God put on every single person he created. It's written on our heart. We know right from wrong. We know what it feels like to do and choose the things that are aligned with God and what it feels like to not. It also is an awareness. Like when we have these emotional outbursts of just the hurt that we have and God is the heal is the healer of those hurts. He helps bind up our wounds and emotions are complex, but if we have this new way of thinking about them, we're able to see them as these tools that truly can alter our relationship with God. And when we focus and are intentional about rooting them out and having this more this ability to manage them better and have more self-control over them, we really do start to change transformatively from within because as we start to love the thing God loves and hate the things that God hates, we have a much more clearer understanding of the world around us and of ourselves. And we can connect with God in a way that helps us feel that healing power that he gives us and gives us the strength to face the stuff that's not good and does grieve us and does anger us, but we're able to work through it in a much more holistic, healthful way rather than just pushing them off to the side, ignoring them, or just allowing them to continually run rampant within us. Digging out these negative emotions, these negative habit patterns of thinking changes us dramatically. It's like meeting a person who has recently been baptized or come to know Jesus. Their spirit is full and vibrant. Their eyes are vibrant and they have so much to say and they have a peace about them. You like being around them. That's God's presence. And so if we're really struggling in our sin, we really need to write our priorities and and really dig into where God is in our heart. And if we are allowing our flesh to dictate more of who we are, well, we've got to fix that. We've got to fix that. So I wanted to dive into this because I just know there's a lot of emotions going around in the world just in general. And uh, we're approaching such a season where it's easy to allow our emotions to run rampant, but that is not a healthy way to live. That's not a godlike way to live. And we could all be better for doing this type of work. Dig into Romans uh, chapter seven and really go read that and read, you know, all before it and all after it and journal about that, pray over that. And anything that is triggering or obvious to you, pray specifically over it because it God will heal it and God will transform you from within. So that's all I have for you today on the Thought Vault. I if you're struggling a lot with this and you want to contact me, please reach out. Please consider sending me an email. There's a link in the show notes or messaging me on Instagram. I do have a few options right now for one-on-one coaching during the summer months. And if this is a later time that you're listening to this, just always reach out to me um, and let's see how we can work together possibly. And and I can help you through this process. But also um, if you want to just, if you're struggling with something specific, you can send in an anonymous question. There's a link in the show notes. It's our Dear Emily section of the podcast. So I'm collecting anonymous questions and then I come on and answer them on the podcast or give feedback, whatever. It's kind of like the Dear Sally back in the old days when you would write into the paper and then hope they give you a response. So you can send in an anonymous question through that and we can dig in a little bit to 
what you're going through. I promise you, more than likely, you are not alone and someone else can definitely relate and we can all come away with some much needed help in that way, in that arena of life. So please send in that question. And if you haven't already, please subscribe to the show and please leave a five-star review. This truly helps the reach of this show and it's completely free to do so. And it would mean the world to me if you could leave a five-star review on the show. So until next time, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Romans 12, 2. Go live with bold intention, everyone. Bye for now.